Oh man, hey, good morning. Oh, that was loud in my ear. We'll take that out for a second. Hi, family. I'm going to read something to you. Because it's good. And it's in red, which means Jesus said it. So it's already really that good. So John 4, 23, it says, But the hour is coming, and, and now is here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. And this morning we were practicing and we we're getting ready to do worship with our family and our family who's working, who can't be here. We love you. Um, and man, we just, it may seem a little different this morning. We're going to start off kind of different and that's okay. Um, I think sometimes we show up and it's 10 o'clock and we like jump right into the songs and they're good and we meet with Jesus and that's important. And I think sometimes it's also important to sit and rest in the fact. And sometimes you just got to let other things continue to like almost warm us up and speak to us. So Kayla is going to play and sing a little bit and DJ is going to play and sing a little bit. And in this moment, I encourage you to one, recognize that this is the hour to let it all go, right? Like whatever we came in with this week, we get to let it all go. We get to be all in and meet with Jesus because he's worth it. So this morning, and I know that not, you know, I know that sometimes I do this where I show up and I'm like, it's a business meeting and here's my three songs I'm going to sing to Jesus and I'm, well, oh, better make sure everybody has an encounter. And this morning, you know, and obviously I'm free from that, but this morning I want to invite you so you can stand, you can sit. Um, those of you who are feeling really brave, feel free to come to the altar early, you know. Um, I know some of the times that's where I had to work out some of my stuff. So in this moment, if you need to sit, if you need to stand, um, let's just let... Jesus speak to us through Kayla and her songs and, and then we'll sing, I promise.
thank you that you're in the stillness. Thank you that you're in the wind. Thank you that you're with us now. So, Father, this morning we declare that we're going to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we come to your throne with expectation, with just to meet with you. Thanks, Jesus. I'll stand now. And I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. And I raise a hallelujah. Louder than my unbelief, and I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody, and I raise a hallelujah. And heaven comes and fights for me. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar And up from the ashes, hope will arise Cause death is defeated, or oh, the king is alive I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah and I will watch the darkness flee. And I raise a hallelujah. And I raise a hallelujah Fear you've lost your hold on me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar And up from the ashes Hope will arise, cause death is defeated, the king is alive. Oh, oh yeah. He's alive, he's alive. So sing a little louder, sing a little louder, and sing a little Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. 
And up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, for the King is alive. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. And up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, oh the King is alive. Walking around these walls And I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet And waiting for change to
It is. 
My eyes are on you, and it is well with me. This week I was reminded how important it is to be surrounded by people of faith. People who remind you that Jesus hasn't fallen off the throne. That fear is a liar and that all things, I said all things, work together for the good of those who love God. I was given many opportunities to sing in the face of fear and in the face of my anxiety. I was reminded that even if I'm seated at the table with all of my enemies, that through the shed blood of Jesus that all of my monsters have been defeated. Let's prepare to take an offering. Lord, I just want to thank you for the work that you've done in all of us this week and for never leaving us and for surrounding us with people who can hold us up when we can't stand on our own. We are so blessed to be loved by you. Please continue to work in our lives, Lord, and continue to show the world what it's like to walk out in your faith. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please bring forward your tithes and offerings. been a heavy week for new life we got to see the enemy and then we got to see the victory we'll share more about that later because we can't share it all yet there's too much so we just want to do one thing real quickly I want to just pray for Daniel is my mic on turn me up a little bit I feel quiet there we go now I feel better I feel better let's pray for Daniel Jasper can we do that why don't you just take a little bit of time yourselves? Why don't you just call upon God and just a second, I'll just step in. Father, every once in a while, you create a man that is so far ahead of us that we can't even understand, has a calling so far higher than ours that we can't comprehend. And sometimes that man hides in the shadows because he doesn't believe in his call. But you called him out this week. You showed him to us this week. And he showed us things that were just too wonderful to, to even speak right now. So I pray you continue to be with Daniel and, and encourage him to step into that God calling. Heal whatever brokenness is broken, but if it's holiness, open it up. Because we want to see more. Be with Daniel's family, Lord God, and encourage them that you're holding his hand. We love you. I do want to thank this congregation for being there for them. I want to thank them for their faithful giving, Lord God, to support not just this ministry, but the family, Jasper family. 
This is a God thing we're experiencing, Father. And we're recognizing it, and we're going to respond to it correctly. We're going to be obedient to what you say and what you show us. In Jesus, we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Good morning, New Life. It's nice to be together today. It's 1030. I got two hours to go. That's good. It's been a pretty heavy series, has it not? <clears throat> Seems like every week, you know, some, sometimes you just preach, you do church and you're just doing church to do church. And then sometimes it actually lines up with life. And when that happens, you want to pay attention to what God's doing. Because everything we've preached in the last few weeks, God has shown us things about that beyond the Sunday sermon. So I'm not sure what's going to happen next week because I'm a little bit nervous after what happened last week. But we've been in a series called Monsters, My Monsters, talking about some of the heavy things that we deal with, especially mental things. Dealt with rumination, how you, we overthink things and takes us places we don't want to go and Actually, it makes us think things that aren't so and takes us places we don't want to go and makes us into somebody we don't know. Keeps us longer than we want to stay. Takes God out of the way. We talked about anxiety. And how praise is the victory. We don't just sing these songs, by the way, because they're good songs. We sing these songs because we believe the doctrine behind them. Amen? We believe that this stuff works. So for all of you that are new to New Life and you think we're just a bunch of crazy people, you have not met God yet. <laughs> Don't be offended by that. We'll help you. We'll guide you on that way. And one day you'll be just like Ashley up here telling stories about your life. As a younger preacher, I was filled with hope and I knew nothing of depression. And in my youthful zeal, I made a statement that I'll never forget. I said... And the moment that I said it, I knew it was wrong, but I said it anyway. That's what young preachers do. That's why you want to watch young preachers. Older preachers are smarter than that. Young preachers are kind of stupid. I said, depressed believers are not believers at all. And I believed that for 10 years. Until the November of 2007, when God asked me in a season of transition to do something I didn't want to do, and God, because I kept fighting God on it, He just kind of put me in this place where I would be submissive to Him, and God will do that at times. Sometimes in a season of transition, we don't want to obey Him. We want to kind of rebel against it. I went into that first season of, of depression, and I, I really um, battled it, and I didn't get free until I submitted to God, until I said, okay, I'll do what you want me to do, and in that transition, the transition happened because God wanted it done, and I finally submitted to it, and I came out of that. The second was a season of tragedy, where I had been in ministry a long time, and when you've been in ministry a long time, you've been around church and Christianity, there's a lot of negativity. It's not just church negativity. I mean, there's a lot of pain that people bring to Christ that kind of rubs off on you. There's Divorce and there's disaster and there's death. And you want to add to that, there's always some negative person in your life. You always have to deal with some negative, crappy church person. <laughs> and it's good for five years, but it gets a little wearisome about 10 years. In about 15 years, you kind of wonder what in the world you're doing. And in about 20 years, you're just, you're done. And I snapped. And in that season of tragedy, I went to some of the leaders in the church and I said, I'm not showing up for church on Sunday and I don't know when I'll be back. Because I'm going crazy. This makes you nervous now, I can tell. This is really cool. I'm having fun now. <laughs> what threw me over the edge after all of that negativity was a beautiful little family had a beautiful little baby who did not survive. 
And you know, you can only take so much negativity. Many great men in the Bible knew depression. But we don't talk about these things in church because we either want to pity somebody for it. Oh, they're just sad. They're really sad. Or we want to assign a a reason for a problem. Oh, they're always sad. If they just had more faith, just let me help you. Depression is not a faith issue. Depression is an issue of hope. There's a difference. Rumination is a faith issue. Anxiety is a faith issue. Depression, that's a hope issue. It's kind of funny that that we have this attitude towards depression, especially in the church, because every human being will face some form of depression experience in their life. It might just be to you a season of sadness. You might not recognize it as depression, but that's what it is. Or it might be to the extreme, because depression has some major extremes. And And this is important to talk about, because... Depression is one of Satan's greatest tools to destroy the work of God. Because if Jesus is the hope of the world and Satan destroys hope, then there is no hope, then there is no Jesus, right? I mean, at least you're not going to promote Jesus if you have no hope. So what we've been talking about the last few weeks is, is true with every one of these monsters. Every one of these monsters has a history. There's something that got you there. You can tell where you are by where you've been. (laughs) You can tell where you are by where you've been. So we're going to look at the story of Elijah to kind of get some history. So just just come into the story with me for a moment. Let Let me just share it. So Elijah, the first time he actually stepped into his biblical callings was God asked him to go stand before a wicked king and tell the wicked king these words. One day uh, he went to King Ahab and said, I'm a servant of the living Lord, living Lord, the God of Israel, and I swear by his name that it won't rain till I say so. There won't even be any dew on the ground. So this is a wicked king and his first call, Elijah's first call, first thing God asked him to do is to go stand before the king and say, it's not going to rain until I say so. Now, I don't know about you, but that would be pretty tough. You're standing before a king who could have you killed at any point in time. And you're telling this king, this is your first assignment. The first time you get to step on the platform is to tell the congregation, by the way, you're not going to be blessed. Welcome to New Life. I'm glad you're here. (laughs) It sounds like it's easy, but it's not. So it makes the king angry. And God takes Elijah and sends him out into the wilderness. And he sends him to a place called near Cherith Creek. And it's this place where God gives him provision. And God provides in the middle of a drought water from a stream and food from ravens. Now, again, we get this picture of this food being delivered, this raven flying into a windowsill and grabbing a freshly baked pie that was in the sill and, and flying back with it. But you've got to understand, this is in the middle of the drought. So any food that they had... They ate, and any food that they was bad was really bad food, and that's what they kicked out. And the ravens would grab that food and bring it to Elijah. So don't get this image in your mind that he was getting berry pies every day. He was getting garbage food. Could you imagine how hard it would be to totally rely on God for everything? Now, we say in our minds, oh, I do, I do. Not really. We think we do, but we don't. Because we always have governmental help, don't we? It may not be the help that we want, but we always know there's something. We could get food and put it on our table someday, could we not? It's the country we live in. There was no parental help. He didn't have parents to come bail him out, which is kind of the thing that I'm reading about with millennials. I think it's kind of funny. Not knocking millennials at all. I'm just saying that parents are doing a great job of making sure that you don't hurt yourselves. have to struggle a little bit. I want to do something there, but I... 
There was no GoFundMe account. Elijah didn't have some friends say, hey, tell you what, put on online a GoFundMe account. Hey, would you support Elijah in the desert? <laughs> I'm not knocking that. I think that's great that we have all those things. But I just want you to think about for a moment what it would be like to have just water from a, a, a creek in the desert and birds. And that's all your provision. And then every day it gets a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less. And then it goes away. Think about how hard that was. He had the power to call down rain from heaven and didn't do it because he knew God did not allow him to. Let me just make a statement because, and this is free. This was extra. This is not part of the sermon. This is just helpful. Just because God gives you no provision does not mean you have permission to get it yourself. Just because God has not given you provision doesn't mean that you have permission to get it yourself. Oh, that preaches so well. And you're all sitting there looking at me like, what is he talking about? From there, Elijah was sent to a single mom. This single mom was making her last meal for her and her son, and then they were going to die. She, in her mind, has, has made the, made the uh, uh, transition to, to realize that we're going to have this meal, and it's going to be our last meal, and then my son's going to die, and I'm probably going to watch him die because I'm bigger, and then I'm going to die. And, and God sends Elijah to her, to this uh, single mom, and says to the single mom, hey, I got a car payment that I need to make. Would you mind giving me your last $300 to make the car payment? And I know your son and you are going to starve and die. But uh, could you imagine asking a single mom for her last 300 bucks? And you know she's got to supply, support her child. Now, Elijah says, God told me that, that if you do this, he's going to bless you. And the woman does it. And God blesses him. But could you imagine how hard it would be to ask that single mom to support you in what you're doing? Because God says to do that. See, I believe this. If you trust God with all you have, you can trust God with all you need. That fell over like a lead rock. (laughs) If you trust God with all you have, you can trust God with all you need. Because he will never let the oil run out and he will never let the flour go bad. Just keep filling up. See, the reason you don't know that is because you've never given him all. (laughs) I'll get some reaction out of you. After saving the family from death, and she in her mind has said, This is great. God saved me, my son, and myself, and now we're healthy and good. The son dies. And she goes to Elijah and says, I had it in my mind that he was going to die, and I was okay with that. Then you bring him back to life. You give me hope, and then he dies. You take that hope back away. What are you doing, Elijah? What's wrong with you? What kind of preacher are you? And Elijah has to go into a room, beg God, please don't make me look bad in front of this single mom. And the child comes back to life. For Elijah, there was no easy provision, there was no easy decision, there was no easy connection, there was no easy position. And this went on for three years, three and a half years. And then God says this in 1 Kings 18.1. He said, go meet King Ahab and I'll make it rain. And you might think, oh great, great, it's over. It's over. But what you don't know history-wise is Elijah has killed every prophet of God in the nation because he was so mad at, at Elijah. There was only a hundred that was saved, and it was saved by somebody else, but all the other prophets of God were killed because Ahab was so angry at Elijah. On top of that, Ahab sent uh, emissaries throughout the neighboring countries and said, hey, is Elijah there? And he made them promise that Elijah wasn't in that country. He was so angry, he would have invaded a nation to find Elijah and kill him. He was so angry. So Elijah had to go face him in that. Could you imagine having to go face an enemy that you know is really angry at you and has the right to kill you? So Ahab and Elijah meet. Ahab says, you're the problem. And Elijah says, no, you're the problem. And they get into this really cool battle that I really want to preach on, but I can't because it's not the point. The people of God are not following God, and they're following a false god, 
And Elijah says, hey, people of God, how long you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be one, follow him. If, if, if Baal be God, follow him. And they didn't say a word because they're kind of playing this church game. Some of them were kind of serious about their faith. Some of them were full of crap. Appropriate word. <laughs> and Elijah says, he gets this challenge and he says, I tell you what, you get your false God, oh, I mean your false prophets together, and, and, and you try to call down fire from heaven, and if your gods bring fire from heaven, your God's God. But if it doesn't, then I'll ask my God, and my God will bring down fire from heaven. Their false gods, or their false prophets, beg God, no fire from heaven. All of a sudden, Elijah prays a simple prayer, whoo, fire falls, burns everything up, they kill all the prophets, it's an awesome day. <laughs> Victory! Victory! You ever have one of those days where you win? You win. Like you pray and fire falls and things get burnt up and prophets are running all over the place. It's like the coolest thing. <laughs> but a history of great difficulty and great victory often creates great misery. Because the Bible says Ahab told his wife Jezebel, Wimpy. Honey, Elijah killed all my prophets. And he prayed and called fire from heaven. Yeah. So she sent a message to Elijah. You killed my prophets. Hangman's news, hangman's news, hangman's news. Now I'm going to kill you. Knife emoji, knife emoji, knife emoji. <laughs> I pray the gods will punish me even more severely if I don't do it by this time. Praying hands, praying hands, clock. <laughs> right? Just ruined the whole thing. I knew it. <laughs> and Elijah was afraid when he got her message. And he ran. I've always told people, there's only one reason for me to run. Something must be chasing me. Because I ain't running any other reason. If it ain't chasing me, <laughs> there's no purpose behind running. <laughs> I know, someone's going to say exercise. There's a lot of other ways. Elijah was afraid when he got her message, and he ran out of town. Elijah ruminated not on the victories of the past he experienced, but the negativities of the present. She's going to kill me. Remember what happened with um, David is he thought something that wasn't so. That's what happens. We think things that aren't so, and it takes us someplace we don't want to go. He experienced anxiety over his enemy. This is the guy who just defeated 850 prophets of Baal, a false uh, king, uh, a, a, a rebellious people. He just, he just, think about it. He prayed and fire fell from heaven. It wasn't a long prayer. Dear God, bring fire. I mean, that's about it. Come on, wouldn't you like, your, if your prayers were answered that fast, you would be like a prayer warrior. Amen. The only reason you stop praying is because you don't get answers in the time you want them to. But here's this guy. Remember? Uh, it'll take you places you don't want to go. It'll make you believe something not so. It'll take you places you don't want to go, and it'll make you into somebody you don't know. That's not who Elijah was. Elijah was a warrior, man. And here he is running from a woman. ba -doom boom Here he is running from a woman. Who sends him emoji texts <laughs> and threats? And now we find Elijah, who prayed a fire falling, offering consuming miracle prayer, depressed. I'm gonna say it one more time, but a history of great difficulty and great victory often creates great misery. So let's talk about depression for a minute. Let's talk about what it looks like. We can get that out of this passage. 
You can know you're headed to the cave of depression. And I'm not going to say the cave of depression over and over again because it's depressing to say it. I'm going to talk about the cave. So you know you're headed to the cave when these things happen. One, you want to be alone. When you want to be alone, you're headed to the cave. What's the scripture says? Says. Say. <laughs> I'm a preacher, not an English major. <laughs> Elijah was afraid when he got her text. And he ran out of town to Beersheba in Ju Judah and he left his servant there. Now, the servant's job was kind of like an armor bearer. He was supposed to watch over him, protect him, pray for him, encourage him, help him. And he says, no, I don't want any of that. See, when you want to be alone, you're headed to the cave. And maybe it's because your history has been that you've faced great difficulty, but you've even had great victory. And now all of a sudden you're headed someplace. You don't know why you're headed that way. You just know you're afraid. You just know you're scared. You just know you've lost hope. And now you're going somewhere and you don't even know where you're going. You just know you're going alone. Let's be honest today. How many of you struggling with depression recognize that you just want to be alone? You can know you're headed to the cave when you waste your days. When you waste your days. Think about this. Then walked another whole day into the desert. Finally, he came to a large bush and sat under its shade. Now, there was purpose behind that because he always planned in his life. Someday, when I grow up, I hope I can walk out in the desert and find a bush to sit under. That's my dream. That's my desire. No, it wasn't. Nobody dreams to walk out in the desert, <laughs> sit under a bush. That's not your life goal. See, depression leads us into mindless wandering. We just want to stop thinking. And so let's just ask you this question. How many of you who have struggled with drug, drug abuse recognize that you were, you've lost days in mindless wandering to alcohol or drugs? Days. You know you're headed to the cave when you're just trying to shut your brain off and you're doing stupid things. Uh, uh, let's see. It might be video games or television. And you just play video games all the time because you can at least shut your brain off and you don't have to think about it playing video games. So how many days, if we looked on your Xbox account and whatever game you play and we saw how many days you played that game, how many people would say you lost how many days? 122. You're not supposed to shout it out. You know you're headed to the cave. You're just trying to shut your brain out. You're trying to get away. How about Facebook scrolling? Instagramming. Oh, no, I'm really interested in these people's lives. Really? <laughs> your life sucks so bad you got to live it on a little tiny screen? Cat videos? You start sending cat videos? You're heading to the cave, man. <laughs> Joey. You start sending people cat videos, you are headed to the cave. Because you know you had to look for those cat videos before you sent them to me. You spent three hours going, ah, 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 I'm going to send this to everyone I know. And then their account fills up with your cat crap. You're headed to the cave. There is no earthly benefit to cat videos. It will not make you happier. Oh, no, they're so cute. Get a cat. And don't video it, you freak. <laughs> and my staff is just going to light this one up. This is going to be great. And I do not want cat videos in this thing tomorrow. Let me give you the third thing that, that's an indicator of you going to the cave. When you self-depreciate. David said this. I've had enough. Just let me die. I'm no better than my ancestors. When you do this, when you say, I can't, I've had enough. I can't handle anymore. I just, I just can't handle anymore. How many of you have said that? I just can't handle anymore. Just let me die. I don't want to live anymore. It gets to that level. I suck. I am no better than any. I, I'm like the worst pe people, person I know. <laughs> I'm having a rough time speaking today. How depressing. <laughs> I'm going to go find a cat video. <laughs> you know you're headed to the cave 
When you look at yourself and you don't see the goodness that God sees, you don't see the glory that God created you. And when he created you, he created you perfect. And he said, this is perfect. And you went, no, it's not. It's got faults. And he says, I know that. That's why I gave you Jesus, you dummy. Because now when God looks at you, he looks through his blood and you're purified, glorified, sanctified. I don't have any other fides. Did I say justified? I didn't say justified. When your sleeping and eating patterns are off, you're headed to the cave. Elijah lay down in the shade and fell asleep, and suddenly the angel woke up. Woke him up. That's sleeping in the middle of the day, dude. Woke him up and said, get up and eat. And Elijah looked around. By his head was a jar of water and some baked bread, and he sat up, and he ate, and he drank, and he lay down and went back to sleep. You ever do that? Like you just can't get out of bed? You just want to sleep all the time. Or you can't sleep. Like you're jacked up. How many hours did you sleep last night? Two. In a row? No. And you'll do that for months. When your natural digestion and rest are off, you're off. When you eat too much... You're headed to the cave. When you don't eat enough, you're headed to the cave. It's not natural to eat all the time. It's not natural to not eat. You know you're headed to the cave when your sleep and eating patterns are off. When it never gets better, you're headed to the cave. Soon the Lord's angel woke him up again and said, get up and eat or else you'll get too tired to travel. So Elijah sat up and ate and drank. And the food and water made him strong enough to walk 40 more days in the desert. It's not getting better. It's not getting better. Elijah, listen, listen. Boy, please don't raise your hand, but if you're headed to the cave, if one of these things is a part of you, you're headed there. You may, you're not there yet, but you're headed there. And it will not be long before you get to that place called the cave of depression. But let me show you something that will knock your socks off. All you depressed people can now throw it in the face of all those undepressed people. What I'm going to tell you right now. Because I want you to see what happens. At last, he reached Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Where did he go? The mountain of God. The next verse says this. And he spent a night in there. He spent the night there in a cave. Wait a minute. He spent the night there. Where? Where did he spend the night? There. In the mountain of God. Depression led him to a cave located where God was dedicated. Where was the cave? In the mountain of God. Whose mountain was it? God's mountain. Where was he camping? God's mountain. See, depression is a cave of hopelessness that can lead us to where God dwells. I'm going to say it one more time because I don't think you got it. (laughs) Depression is a cave of hopelessness that leads you to where God dwells. Want some evidence? Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is there. Where? To rescue all who are where? Discouraged and given up hope. Where's God? He's wherever the depressed people are. See, I keep hearing people say, I just want to be close to God. I just want to be close to God. I just want to have this intimate relationship with God. I'll tell you how to have it. Get depressed. (laughs) Go through great difficulty. Have a great victory. have Have a woman threaten you. Amen? Well, I gotta go... You want to be alone, you want to waste your days, you self-depreciate, your eating patterns are off, never gets better, and you're headed right to where God is. I'm only telling you that because, see, in a time of hopelessness, we don't realize that God recognizes where he needs to be to help us as humans. He needs to be where we don't have any hope. So for those of you that are depressed, you're like, where's God? He's right there. God is at the entrance of your hopelessness. He is at the entrance of 
your hopelessness. Now, I know. You know God was there when he asked you to go deeper and fight your enemies. God was there. You know God was there when he led you away from a place of prosperity and into a place of poverty, yet he still provided for you. You knew God was there. He fed you in a place of dependency where you had to rely on him. You knew God was there. When he asked you to trust him explicitly, you knew that God was there. When he asked you to pray powerfully, you knew God was there. When he gave you personal victory, you knew God was there. And when the enemy threatened you painfully, you knew God was there. And when his angels were sent to, to love you comfortably, God was there. And you know what's interesting about this? It leads us to this place of this cave where God is. And the interesting thing to me is this. God wants to know, if I'm here, why are you there? The Lord asks Elijah, why are you here? God says, if I'm in the entrance, why are you in the cave? If I'm at the entrance, why are you at the cave? I'm going to say that again because I think I need to repeat it over and over again. <laughs> God says, if I'm at the entrance, why are you in the cave? You know what I learned about the cave this week? This is very personal. I, I heard this from somebody who was there this week. Inside the cave are all of your dreams that never came true. All of the dreams. Every little stupid thing that you thought should have happened that didn't happen are in there. All of your failures that you could ever imagine are in that cave. All of your failures are in there. And in there, you can't see God's provision or his protection or his power. You can't even see your own hand in front of your face because in that cave of depression, in that cave, deep down in there, you can't even identify yourself. You've lost your identity in the depth of depression. And the demons want you to go deeper. The demons want to tell you, you might as well give up. You might as well end it. You might as well commit suicide. Because your life sucks and you suck and you deserve this place. And God's out there saying, why are you there? I am out here. I know your answer because I've lived it. Verse 10 says, Lord God, all powerful. It's funny how when we're in the depth of hopelessness, we still believe that God's all powerful. Which is a lie, by the way. Because we know he is, but we don't believe he is. Or you wouldn't be in there. I've always done my best to obey you. Notice he doesn't say I've been perfect. I've always done my best. But your people have broken their solemn promise to you, and they have torn down your altars and killed all your prophets except me. And now they're even trying to kill me. Let me, let me break this down a little bit more for personal reasons. I've done my best, but you let others get away with murder. That's the things that I was saying to God. I've done my best. I've sacrificed so much for you. I've suffered for you. I've put up with all this garbage, and I've fought these battles for you, and I've fought for people, and this is what I get from it. Other people don't have any of these problems like I have. You ever feel that way? Come on, depressed people. Let's stand. In the... One thing that's true, you may think you're alone, but we're all in the same place. See, you're unhappy because you don't like the life you've been given. And you think God's being unfair to you, which is why you're there. But you don't understand, God's at the entrance of the cave. He's so unfair that his presence is where you're in a place of hopelessness. The question I think, the other question I had is, was I really sad because people don't want to follow God or because I didn't want to follow God anymore? See, with depression, it's easy to deflect. The reason I'm in here is because of other people. And the reason you're in there is because you chose to run. You know, I had one sentence I repeated over and over and over again in both seasons of depression. Remember what they were, Deborah? I don't want to do this anymore. I said it over and over. I would stare out the window for hours and say, I don't want to do this anymore. I would tell my wife over and over again, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to to do this anymore. And the demon was saying, yeah, you don't want to do this anymore. You 
you been there? Are you there now? Are you there now? Are you there now? Because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share something that's going to knock your socks off. I'm going to freak you out. Who'd be honest and say, I'm there right now? I don't think bless was the word that I came to mind. That's okay. It echoes in a cave. Because I want to give you this. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. Go out and stand at the mountain, the Lord replied. I want you to see me. I want you to see me, God says. God says, why are you there? I want you to see me. Why are you there, Elijah? I want you you to see me, God says. God says, I want you. To, do you get that depressed person? God is calling you right now at this moment. And he's saying, I want to see you. I want to see you. I want, this is God. Get that image in your mind. God says, I want to see you. Come on. I'll raise a hallelujah. I want to see you. Could you imagine? God saying to you, I want to see you. When I pass, I want you to see me when I pass by. I want you to see me. But here's what we do. I'm just going to get kicked in the shins for this one. All at once, a strong wind shook the mountain and shattered the rocks, but the Lord was not in the wind. Next, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Then there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. See, God says, the problem with you humans is you're always looking for me in the places that I'm not. See, you don't look for me outside of the cave of depression. And if you do look for me there, you're looking for me in a whole different way. You're, you're, lo you're looking for me to have a spectacular salvation. You, you want me to show up and, and, and angels coming and, 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 uh, uh, on horses and Harleys bunch of bikers in white, not black, because not coming from heaven. Yeah. And we're going to save the day. How many of you in depression have said, I just want God to save me from this, and I want him to just show up with all of this battle garb and just save me? God's not in the spectacular man manifestations you're wanting. I just want God to show me. Show me, God, that you're real. Show me, God, that you're real. Show me something. Show me something about who I am and where I'm at. I want you to show me, God. He's not there. God, I need a spectacular miracle. If you did a miracle, I would come out of this cave. If you did something miraculous, you'd come out of the cave. God is not in the miracles. It's not that he doesn't save, do, that he doesn't manifest, or do the miraculous. He's in the still, small voice or the gentle breeze. You can take it whatever version you want. See, right now he's in that still, small voice speaking to you. See, and if you're going to hear that still, small voice, you've got to stop speaking because when you're speaking in a cave, all it does is echo your voice. So if you're in the cave... God wants you to see him. But the only way for you to hear him is if you listen for that still small voice. So what's God saying to you right now? Come on, church. What's he saying to you right now? No, he's not telling you go to pizza after church. <laughs> what's he saying to you right now? Especially if you're struggling with depression, what's he saying to you right now? What's he saying to you right now? What's he saying to you right now? In that cave, he's trying to speak to you. He wants to, you to see him and he wants to speak to you.
And when Elijah heard it, what happens if we hear God? What happens if we hear the voice of God? Well, let's just do what Elijah did. He covered his face with his coat. I take that as a picture of submission to God. Surrender. Surrender your sadness to God. If you hear the voice of God and you're in that cave and God's saying, I love you. Come see me. I'm out here. You're going to have to surrender that sadness and humble yourself, cover your face. Can you surrender your sadness today? The second thing I see is he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. That's a picture of repentance. Repentance means that you walk away from the darkness and you go to the light. You know what I've learned about repentance this week? Repentance is, um, I should have wrote this down because now I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, repent, repentance uh, um, reverberates. I watched a young man this week repenting of everything he's ever done. If you walked into his room this, this week, he would repent of something that he did to you. He would tell you things that you didn't even know he was feeling or thinking. You had no idea, man. He just puked it all out. And you know what it made me do? Want to repent. Because I went, crap. If this is who you are, what? I'm sorry. I just repented of the stuff I needed to repent of. You know what's interesting to me? How few people truly repent. It's so odd. You want to say, stop, stop, stop repenting. No, no, no. You got to, once you start trying to repent of your darkness, repent of your sin, repent of why you're in that cave. You need to just repent and keep repenting. And what it should do is reverberate in everyone else around you. We got this image of, of, of this, this, this repentance just going. What would happen in your home if you just started repenting of sin to your spouse and, and you'd say, well, well they, they would never repent. doesn't matter. It might be your kids that catch the repentance. Might be your neighbors, might be your friends. Am I the only one that gets this? I think this is pretty exciting. The third thing he did is he stand and stood in his presence. Remember what I said last week about anxiety and my sister? As long as my sister was around, no one could hurt me. As long as God's around, who's going to mess with you? If you're standing with God, who's going to mess with you? Listen, you got nothing to fear if God is right there. You can put him in front, you can put him in the back, you can put him in the side. He don't care. He's still God. The question is, if you're in the cave, are you looking to go farther in or are you looking to come out? God's on the outside. But to do that, you're going to have to surrender your sadness. You're going to have to repent. You cannot get out of that cave if you will not repent of the sins that got you in there. Go stand by God. You're safe there. It's the best place to be with God. Where's God? In his mountain. Where's the cave? In the mountain of God. Where's God? At the entrance of the cave. And what's he saying? I want you to see me. See, I would think that if you're, this is your song, if this is your truth, I mean, that why you're here is to leave and to meet with God. Your song should be, all I want is just to know your heart. And would you keep me here until we're one? All I want is just to know your heart. Will you keep me here until we're one? If you're in the presence of God, why would you want to be anywhere else? Why would you want to go into the cave? And why would you want to go anywhere else? Why wouldn't you want to just stay where God is? All I want is just to know your heart. Will you keep me here until we're one? Now, there's more to the story as there is to yours. Elijah never fully got out of that place of darkness. He left the cave, but he still didn't get over his sadness because I don't believe he would fully repent of why he got there. 
And God sent him to another who took his anointing and his appointing and his approval. And God then sent somebody else to kind of walk the journey out the rest of his life. His name's Elisha. So that Elijah would never truly be alone again. And I believe this. If you choose to live in depression, you can live through the rest of your life. And God will give your anointing to reign. Your appointing to defeat giants. And your approval for victories to somebody else. If, that's, if you can't handle it, God will hand it off to somebody else. And God will bring somebody alongside of you to kind of hopefully encourage you in that dark place. But you don't have to stay there. So what do we do with all this? Let me, let me summarize it and we'll go home. If you're struggling with depression today, look at your history and identify all the times you saw God there. Pray that what he did before, he will do again. If he did it before, he'll do it again. Remember we talked about that last week. If he did it before, he'll do it again. If he did it before, he'll do it again. Start looking at your past as your future, not as, your, as, it's, as it's gone. If God did it in your past, he will do it in your future. Second thing, look at your heart for honesty. Why are you there? Are you just upset that you don't like the life that God gave you? Because what he gave you is a life that you could be anointed, appointed, and approved in. He gave you a life where you could be victorious if you trust in him. He gave you a life that didn't, isn't going to be easy, but it is going to be provided for. Everywhere Elijah went, God provided for him all that he needed to do life to the best of what God needed him to have. Are you thinking God's not fair? I think he, he gave you experiences to show you that he's been there the whole time. You just aren't seeing him in it. And where is your hope? Why don't you be honest today? Why are you here? Where is your hope? Is your hope in the provision of the world or in the provision of God? Is your hope in the power of yourself or the power of God? Because we don't have the power to to get victory in our own selves. We have to get that anointing and appointing and approval from God. It's got to come from Him. Let me give you the third thing. If you're struggling with depression, find a professional to guide you out of the darkness. The first time I didn't do that, the second time I did, I came out of it the second time, the, the first time I stayed in it until I got rolled into the next one. That sucks. Well, let me also make a statement that might be controversial. See a counselor or a psychiatrist that specializes in these things. Don't go to your general doctor. If you break a leg, go to him. If you break your brain, go to somebody who knows how to work on a brain. Amen? My general doctor is good. But she's not that good. Amen. That one was free. Let me give you the third one, and I think, for me, the most important one. Look for the angels that God sends you. You want to know where they are? They're right up front, right in this front row right here. You want to know why they're up front in this front row? Because they're going to pray with you. Angels are messengers of God seeking to encourage physical, emotional, and spiritual health. And there were two angels that came to Elijah. There was the first one that came to him and said, get up and eat, you're not alone. You know who that is? That's the preacher. Yes, I'm going to pat myself on the back and say I'm an angel. <laughs> I'm a messenger of God who wants to encourage you. Listen, I've been there. You have not experienced anything that I have not experienced. I'm not preaching something that I just made up and I thought, well, this would be fun to preach. This is something I experienced face, face on. And I know you can come out of there and I know God's on the other side because the greatest experience I had was coming out of that cave and getting to see God in ways that I couldn't see if I wouldn't have been in there. I'm not just talking about God as if I think he's, he's true. I saw him. I heard him. I followed him. And I'll tell you, get up. Eat. Eat. You're not alone. 
But these angels up here, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to tell you, get up and eat. Pray. Read your Bible. Eat. Or else you'll give up and die. And finally, if you're in that cave, listen for God. He's trying to communicate with you. Shut off the games. Turn off the drugs. Tune in to the voice of God. Just sit in the quiet and don't think. Meaning that you're going to have to pray, God, don't let me think. And one last thing. In that place of silence where you're waiting for God to speak, there's one thing I want you to do that I learned this week that just has floored me. See, in the cave, we have a tendency to speak to God about our sadness. Why don't you tell your sadness about God? Why don't you stop telling God about how sad you are and why you're in there? Because God knows you're sad and why you're in there. What your sadness needs to hear is my God's going to get me out of here. What your sadness needs to hear is I'm not going to live with you forever. In fact, I think we're going to divorce. <laughs> me and you, sadness, I've got another love. Greater than life itself. Right? I, I got somebody who wants me to be with them, and they're in the light. They're not in the darkness. And so I'm going to tell the sadness, go to hell. Amen. And by the way, shame, you can go there too. Because yeah. I know whose I am. Yeah. Lord, I belong to you. You think we sing these songs just because they're fun. We sing them because we're speaking truth into you. Yeah. Trying to tell you, you can believe that there's a God that wants to take you out of the darkness and bring you into light. And he wants you to see him and know him and love him. Let's stand. Thank you for your patience. But let me say this. Because some of you have some strongholds that you need to break through. And you're going to be really uncomfortable in how I'm going to ask you to break them. If you're struggling with depression, if you're struggling with depression, or maybe you know somebody who is struggling with depression, what I'm going to need you to do is I'm going to need you to come up front. I'm going to need you to grab one of these guys in the front row. And I'm going to need you to ask them to pray with you because you can't do this alone. This is a platform of healing through this season. You can see we're writing all over it. I want you to come up front. If you're struggling with depression or you know somebody, know somebody who is, I want you to come up. I want you to grab one of these people who are in the front row. They're angels. God sent you to pray with you and to pray for you to give you victory, to let you know you're not alone, to tell you to get up and eat. you got a long journey ahead of you. And after you're done praying, and it's not going to be a prayer for eternity, but after you're done praying, what I want you to do with these people in the front row is I want you to come up, and I want you to write your name horizontally, and I want them to write their name vertically in the shape of a cross. Because the only way you're going to get victory is through Jesus Christ. You're not going to get it any other way. So this is going to take a little bit of time. So those of you that have never been depressed, I'm going to tell you, be patient. Because you know what's going to happen to you? If you're not careful, you're going to go through depression. You haven't experienced it? God says, fine, I'll show you what it's like. So be patient and pray for people who are coming. You say, that's a threat. Yes, it is. It's a warning. Because I know how God works. You're, you can say, what I did, Christians, <laughs> believers that uh, struggle with depression aren't believers at all. I know that's not true. We're just in the cave. We need somebody to say, get up and eat. Gracious Heavenly Father, they can't do this alone. They think they can. They've been living it alone. They've been living in this point of depression for so long, Lord God, that they're down in that cave and they just think they can handle it. And they can't. They're in darkness. They've lost their identities. They've lost their lives, Lord God, to this deep sadness. Father, this is just a beginning moment for them. So encourage their hearts to come to this altar of healing. That they might be free, Father. Jesus, we pray. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Lord's touched your heart.
struggling with depression, come on. Come up front. church. to say this very clearly. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. If you're here today and you don't know that Jesus loves you, you need to ask one of these people up front how to share Jesus with you. As Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Jesus said, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, you may be also. Jesus says, I want you to be with me. I don't want you to be in that darkness. I don't want you to be in that cave. I don't want you to be alone. I want you to feel love and life and liberty in me. Would you come out to Jesus today? Would you come out to Jesus today? Be free. How I love you and my soul sings. My soul sings. My soul sings. How I love you. play church, we fight the devil here. We're serious about this thing. This isn't a game to us. We believe that there is a spirit world. We believe that that Satan and his demons are trying to pull you down into a hole. We believe that there is a God that wants to draw you out and to love you and to comfort you and to encourage your heart. And he wants to give you freedom to stand in the light.
believe Jesus Christ makes a difference. We believe that the world needs the church. We believe that you don't have to live in depression. And you're surrounded by believers who want to love you out of that hole. That's why we sing together. We're going to shout out freedom. Amen? We're going to call it down. Call it out. Next week is PTSD week. You might say, oh, I don't have PTSD. Come next week. We'll find out what you got. I want to help you with that. I also want to encourage another thing. This week, I'm going to take it for Joey because I don't know where he is. I want you to be an angel this week. I want, I want you to have a meal with somebody going through difficult seasons. This week, find somebody going through a difficult season and have a meal with them. Get them to eat. Get them to get out. And then pray with them about the hope you have in Jesus Christ. And then you bring them to church next Sunday and you encourage them and tell them they're going to find love here. They're going to find life here. They're going to find liberty here. But you've got to have the meal. You've got to be the angel. Because it's a journey for them and they don't know how long it is. Are you ready for it? Let me pray over you. Father, I want to thank you, Lord God, for the angels in the room, the messengers of God, Lord God, who are sharing with those who are sad and lonely and hurting and broken, that there's a God that is wanting to meet them, that there's a God that wants to save them and to love them and to comfort them and to encourage them, to draw them out of years of darkness and into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. There's a people in this town, in this community, that doesn't want to just play church. We want to be church. We're going to do that this week, Lord God. Encourage your hearts. We love you, Lord God. And Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, you can continue to worship and pray if you want. Otherwise, guys, go home. God bless. Don't forget your kids, please. This is how we fall.